Hello, my name is Lazarus Agapides, and I am Senior Network Engineer at Morel Telecom. This is the first in a series of videos that we are putting together in order to address various aspects of the networking world. We'll be looking at emerging networking technologies. We'll be looking at telecom service trends and best practices for both the enterprise network as well as the telecom providers network. Now, other than the technological aspects of all of these advancements, we'll also be looking at how all of these affect businesses in general. Telecommunications is something that goes far beyond just the technological aspects. It touches the lives of people because it connects people. So we'll be looking at how businesses would be or are affected by new technologies and by new ways of doing things in the telecom uh, industry. But we'll also occasionally be looking at how telecommunications and specific services affect society as a whole. Because like we said, telecommunications and its implications overflow into the realm of human communication. So we'll be focusing on the technology, but occasionally we'll also be looking at implications for both businesses and society as a whole. Now, when we think about networking and telecommunications, often what comes to mind is IT. Now, IT is something that's very specific, and it's actually something that's distinct from networking and telecommunications. Now, this can be seen in the fact that in recent years, IT has started to be referred to as ICT instead of information technology. We have information and communications technology. Now, uh, this is a good uh, development because it is actually stressing and including and saying that communications is a very important part of uh, technology that is used for businesses. But it's still important for us to, to look and see what telecommunications is, how it differs from traditional IT, and why it is so important to support the applications provided by IT. Now, IT in its simplest form can be viewed as the services running on a server and the software running on a client to allow that client to use the services provided. Now, that's a very simplistic view, but it does help us in understanding what the limits of IT are, where IT ends and where telecommunications begin. So IT is really the service, the software that is actually running that is providing the service to the end user. Now, telecommunications and networking are involved in allowing those servers and clients to communicate. Now, that communication may take place over a local area network, may take place over a WAN, may take place over a satellite link, may take place over any combination of those types of connections to get to the actual end user. But essentially, networking is that part, and telecommunications is that part which deals with the infrastructure that connects the nodes providing the service. Now, um, various technologies that we will be looking at over the course of these videos include uh, the Internet of Things, which require a very specific type of networking uh, infrastructure in order to function. We have software-defined networking, where the boundaries between IT and telecom are more fuzzy and are blending. We have cloud computing, which again, is a, a, a melding of the telecommunications technologies and IT. And we have mobile telecom, which are advancements in technology that allow you to connect from anywhere and to connect at extremely high speeds, providing very high quality services. So all of this belongs to the realm of telecommunications and networking. And these are the types of things that we'll be looking at over the next few videos. In today's video, we'll be talking about virtual networking. Now, the whole virtualization trend that has been going on for the past uh, few years has brought about the need to bring a part of the network into the virtual world. Now, virtualization in general 
is taking something that's physical, like a server, or an application, a specific application, and placing it within a virtual environment. And having this virtual environment create or emulate a server or an application and provide the same services that its physical counterpart would provide. Now, uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult to think about virtual networking. We can understand what a virtual server is in general terms, but what is a virtual switch? How can I use a virtual switch? I mean, I have computers that I want to physically connect to the network. How can I do that with a virtual switch? Now, virtual, uh, for example, now virtual networking is, um, is not replacing networking in general. It's not something that's going to replace the actual physical wires and the, uh, the physical devices that are connecting your computer and your servers to the network, uh, at least not yet. Um, but what virtual networking essentially is, is providing networking services to virtual devices. A virtual device cannot be connected to a physical device, obviously. Uh, so we need some something in between to be able to connect that virtual device to the network and subsequently to the users that are using the application. So uh, all of this that ha all of this virtualization has it has to do with what is a buzzword uh, these days uh, has to do with the cloud. Now uh, virtualization essentially all of this occurs in a cloud environment and we'll, we'll go through a, a little bit about what virtualization is so that we can then go on to the next step and see how virtual networking uh, connects with all of that both figuratively and, uh, uh, and literally. So what is virtualization? Virtualization is taking something which is physical and in, in most cases this is a server and creating it in a virtual environment. What that means essentially is that we have a physical server which has a physical CPU, RAM, motherboard and any other um, network card and so on. And we have uh, that device running a virtual environment. That physical device as far as uh, uh, virtual machines go is called a hypervisor. Now a hypervisor is the physical device on which on, which is on a rack and you have the server there which actually is running the physical hardware uh, and so on. Now within that hypervisor we are creating virtual devices. So we have a virtual machine created. That virtual machine is running an operating system now that operating system could be Windows, it could be Linux, it could be whatever you like. And then on that operating system we have some applications, a web server, an email server, a, a, a voice, a, a telephony, uh, voice over IP server. Now this is one single uh, virtual device which has the virtual machine, the OS and the applications running on it. Uh, the hypervisor itself has a CPU, a physical CPU, it has memory and um, it, it also has physical connections to some switch to, which connects it to the, uh, the network and the rest of the world. Um, now when, when we create a virtual machine uh, a part of this CPU, the, the, uh, uh, a part of the resources available to that CPU is made available to that virtual device. Another part is made available to the next virtual device. Another part is made available to the next virtual device. The same goes with memory. Uh, a certain amount is given uh, to each of the virtual machines which are, are there. Now this is very efficient because typically a server will not be using CPU resources continuously over time. So if we have a graph here and we look at a, a physical server, um, the CPU, and if this is 100%, the CPU will maybe initially be used at 100% and then it'll, it'll usually go down to 
less than 10%. And then when we open a program, it might go up to 50 or 80 or 100 and then go back down and so on. So we have a lot of area here where CPUs are not being used. So uh, what we can do is by creating individual virtual devices, uh, these virtual devices can uh, share the CPU resources uh, much more efficiently because um, typically all servers will not be running at 100% at the same time. Typically they will be running 100% at different at varying times. So you'll have uh, another the other uh, device running uh, the second uh, uh, virtual machine running uh, at this uh, CPU rate and then you'll have uh, another one uh, running uh, CPU over time at this rate. So very rarely will all three of these devices uh, reach 100% CPU usage at any time. So uh, a lot of times the CPU is just sitting idle. By including multiple virtual machines, we're able to use fewer CPU, CPU resources to do more. The same goes for memory. Uh, typically, memory changes, the use of memory changes over time. Uh, not as much as the CPU, but it, that is part of it as well. So uh, we might have a physical memory of 64 um, gigabytes on the actual uh, physical server, and we might uh, allocate uh, 24 gigabytes to this server, 24 to this server, and 24 to this server. That's a total of 72 gigabytes. But physically, we only have 64. Now, we can do this because at any one time, each server, in, the, the servers are not going to be running at a maximum uh, usage of 24. Now, it, it may happen, but it's very rare. So we can actually have three servers at 72 gigabit, gigabytes of memory in total. Uh, and we're just essentially using physically 64 gigabytes so we can see how important it is for uh, um, how, how uh, efficient we can get uh, by um, sharing the same CPU over multiple virtual machines and sharing the same memory over multiple virtual machines. Because in this way, we are using these resources much more uh, efficiently. Now, the other thing that, that is also very uh, important here and this this uh, has to do with money and because business is run on money and everything has to do uh, with the budget what we can provide uh, is that all of this exists in one device which is in your rack so uh, where where uh, if you had three physical servers you would actually need more rack space one two three uh, you would need more rack space, you would need more power, you would need more cooling systems, you would need more physical room, you would need uh, more cables, more um, physical switch ports. All of that costs money. So if you're able to reduce this to a single server here, that's a huge savings in, um, in, in, in money. Because here you have multiple CPUs as well. You're going to have to buy... Uh, the chassis of each individual server as well. So this solution is a very, very efficient. And as a result, it's very economical. Now, this is great. That means that we're saving money. We're uh, um, using our resources more efficiently. Uh, in general, it's just, it's just great. But we have a problem. Now, each individual virtual machine has along with it a virtual network card. So this server here has a virtual network card here. The same goes with this one here. The same goes with this one here. The hypervisor, which is a physical device, uh, may have two or more um, uh, physical network interface cards here and here, which connect to two physical switches, which in turn will connect to the uh, rest of the network and to the internet as well. But there's a problem here. How do you connect your uh, device here, your, your uh, virtual device, to the internet and to the rest of the network, to, to, to your actual clients where 
uh, these clients want to connect to this service. How does it, how do you get from here to here? Uh, the answer is virtual network. In the hypervisor, we must create a uh, network infrastructure, a network infrastructure that is enough to allow the servers to communicate with the physical world outside, such as this kind of uh, communication, but also for the physical servers to communicate with each other because there might be, you might have a web server running on this here and a database uh, that the web server uses uh, running on this machine here. So you're gonna need communication here and, and doing something like this would not be efficient at all. So what we need is something in this area here that will allow us to do this. Now, what we can do within a hypervisor is we can create a virtual switch. So we can put a switch in here and have this connect here and this connect here and this connect here. And we can have another virtual switch if we want within the same hypervisor to connect that there. Now we can create any number of virtual switches in here and connect any number of um, uh, virtual machines to those switches. Uh, the important thing to note here is that these switches actually function with real switching uh, functionality. They have MAC address tables, they have um, VLANs created in them. So that means that any, any communication from here this switch will function just like its physical counterpart in allowing that communication to go to where it has to go. So uh, we, we can even create three switches if we want and have each individual uh, NIC connect to each uh, switch and then these switches can connect to any physical NIC of the hypervisor itself. Now here's a cleaner picture of uh, what we drew before. So uh, this virtual machine here is able to communicate with this one here via the switch, via the virtual switch, uh, but it is also able to communicate with the outside world via the physical switch as well, so that services can end up going to the uh, end user. Now, such an infrastructure requires IP addressing just like any other network does. So. Uh, this NIC will have to get an IP address, this needs an IP address, this needs an IP address. Now these could be in the same subnet, these can be in different subnets. Now if they're in different subnets, then these switches have to be layer 3 switches, which means that they have to do some routing as well uh, between uh, routes. So if, if uh, server 1 wants to communicate with server 2, and these are on different VLANs, then this will be on VLAN 1, and this will be on VLAN 2, and then in here we have inter-VLAN routing between uh, the IP address of uh, VNIC 1 to the IP address of VNIC 2. So the default gateway for these individual um, servers will be the SVI po uh, port here, the uh, switched virtual interface of VLAN 1 for this server and of VLAN 2 for this server. So essentially we are recreating the physical network infrastructure that we would use for physical servers in a virtual environment within the hypervisor itself. Now we could at this point do something else. These two switches we can actually make them into a single switch so that we um, can only, we, we have only a single switch to manage here rather than managing two. But in the same way that we need some sort of uh, redundancy in the physical world, just like right here where we have two switches, we need the same kind of redundancy in the virtual world as well. So by having a single switch there, if the process in the hypervisor, which is running the switch, goes down for some reason, then all of these virtual servers will lose their connectivity. So in this case, 
what we would want to do is we'd like to have these two switches even have a second NIC here for each device and have this connect here, this connect here, and this connect here. And then we'll have these two switches connect to each other as well. And we'll also have the, the possibility of doing this. Now it doesn't look very clear, but essentially what this is, is if this switch goes down, all of the virtual machine, if the process which is running this switch goes down, all of the servers here, which have two virtual NICs, will be able to communicate with the outside world going this way or going this way. Same kind of redundancy that we have in a physical network, we recreate in the virtual network itself. Now there's a problem here. What happens if we have uh, many hypervisors? If I have another hypervisor here and another one here and another one here and so on, then what I'll have to do is I'll have to create two switches in each hypervisor and create backups for all of these. The, the, each of these hypervisors is a separate physical device. So we'll have this connect here and this here and here and here and so on. So uh, although the, the diagram is not that clear, what, I'm, what I, what I want to show here is that we're going to need two switches in each hypervisor in order to be able to have the redundancy we need, but also provide the connectivity for all of the virtual machines that are running in all the hypervisors. That, now, here we have four hypervisors. In a typical data center, you might have tens or hundreds of hypervisors times two switches for each one, at least within each hypervisor. Immediately, you can see the number of virtual switches that we can potentially have in such a situation. The number is, is, is huge which means administration of all these switches gets very, very difficult and tedious and prone to mistakes. So there's another solution uh, that happens for in this case. So here's a clearer picture of uh, the type of thing that we have when we have multiple hypervisors. Uh, you, here we have three hypervisors. That means six switches, six virtual switches, all connecting to two physical switches. Now, again, if we were to increase the number of hypervisors to tens or hundreds, the switches are at least two per hypervisor. Typically, you can have more, which means that we have many, many switches that we need to administrate each one individually. Now, this is a problem in administration. This is a problem in scalability. So uh, a solution to this that has been uh, uh, um, proposed and has been actually applied and, and implemented is uh, the creation of switches, virtual switches, that can span multiple hypervisors. And here's an example of just such a virtual switch that spans multiple hypervisors. You can have uh, one virtual switch that connects all of these devices. Of course, one is not uh, um, uh, best practice. There should be at least two, uh, but for simplicity's sake, uh, it's the second one is not uh, shown here, but essentially we can have one virtual switch here that interconnects all of the hypervisor, all of the uh, virtual uh, devices on all of the hypervisors and interconnects them physically to the physical ports of each hypervisor, which can each connect to the uh, physical devices. So this allows us to be able to uh, provide administration on two or three or four virtual switches that can potentially serve tens or hundreds of hypervisors, which can in turn potentially serve hundreds or even thousands of virtual devices. Now, as the scale grows, uh, having a single switch or, 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 or two or three or four switches um, uh, is good for administration, 
but their number should increase slightly as well as the number of uh, virtual devices increases. Uh, just like for any physical network, there should be the appropriate subnetting, the appropriate uh, seg segmentation of the network in order to avoid broadcast, to, to minimize broadcast domains and so on. Uh, and I think the important thing here is to realize that the very same principles that um, that physical networking is subject to are applied in virtual networking. So you still have the segmentation, you still have the broadcast domains, you still have the potential for uh, STP for loops, for layer two loops, you have the potential for routing loops. So uh, all of this infrastructure here is virtual, but it adheres to the same, the very same uh, um, principles. It is subject to the very same principles that physical networking is subject to. Now, uh, virtualization uh, has gone a step further. So going back to this, uh, our original diagram of the hypervisor and the various virtual servers that are running in that, uh, we know that this is much more efficient than having a single physical server running uh, the operating system and running several applications on that. We've already established that is much more efficient. But is it really as efficient as we can get? Well, let's take a look. If we have, um, if we take a look at just one of these virtual servers, and we take a look at uh, the um, the resources it is provided, it has. So we have uh, CPU, we have memory, and we have hard drive space. So we have an operating system running on top of that. So this operating system is using CPU memory and hard drive space. Um, typically, if we look at uh, a typical installation of Ubuntu, um, an installation of just the operating system will result in the, approximately, uh, the use of approximately three gigabytes that'll use several gigabytes of memory and it'll use quite a few cycles of CPU just to get the operating system working. So if we have a virtual server with no applications running at all, just the operating system, we're already using three gigabytes of hard drive space, one or two gigabytes of memory and continuous cycles of CPU. Now, if I just want to run an application such as free radius for example on this uh, virtual machine and nothing else just free radius free radius takes a total of five megabytes of hard drive space and takes several tens of megabytes of memory so immediately we can see that if i want to just run this uh, free radius I need a whole um, foundation of, a, of an operating system which is using comparatively huge amounts of hard drive space and memory and CPU just to run this very lightweight, simple application. Now, in order to be able to get to the next level of efficiency, to be able to run something as simple as free radius with so few resources without having to commit such large amounts of resources to the underlying operating system that's necessary, the solution is what can be called a lightweight virtual machine. Now, the lightweight virtual machine is more commonly known today as a container. Now, a container is very similar to a uh, virtual machine in that it is a device which is virtualized just like a virtual machine has virtual CPU, memory, hard drive space, and so on. Uh, a container is very similar to that. The difference is, and the main and, and most important difference, is that each container is custom made in order to contain only the most, only the necessary operation, the necessary functionality to support the application that is being run. So instead of having Windows or Ubuntu running, which can serve 
many thousands of different types of applications, we have a specific custom-made container which runs only services necessary to run the application. So if we have an application of free radius like before, which only requires five megabytes of hard drive space, comparatively small amount of CPU and memory, then this container essentially will give you exactly what you need and only what you need. Now, immediately you can understand how much more efficient this is because you can run tens, hundreds, or even thousands of containers within a single physical device. Now, each of these containers runs on what is known as a container engine. The container engine is used in order to coordinate and allow the containers to function. It is kind of like the application that's running on an operating system that is providing the services necessary for containers to function. Now the container engine itself runs on an operating system and at this point we're, we've, we've come to a, a very uh, traditional part of uh, servers, an operating system running on specific hardware which in turn is connected to the network uh, that, uh, that will serve that physical device and all of the containers within there. Now the great um, uh, advantages of this is that we're talking about very, very small, um, uh, very, very small in size, efficient, on the order of five megabytes, and it's everything you need to run free radius. Uh, it's very fast. You can easily create a container. There are thousands of custom-made, pre-made containers that you can actually, in the actual uh, interface of such a device you can actually go in and drag and drop containers and say I want uh, various uh, applications to run so you drag and drop the containers you want and you start them running very fast in a matter of seconds you can actually get a, a service up and running uh, it's portable because you can you can take that container or a series of containers save them take them and reapply them onto a different infrastructure uh, that supports the same type of containers um, Scalability by adding more additional containers of the same type to the uh, the infrastructure to the virtual device, you're essentially increasing its capacity, and uh, uh, it's it's extremely flexible because you go in. It's, it's a drag and drop uh, situation. Now the container engine. There are various types of uh, various vendors, various platforms that are used for the container engine. Now, the, the most um, common one or the most popular one is called Docker. And that's exactly because you actually take these containers and dock them, place them onto the infrastructure that you want to create. There are others as well. There's Rocket, LXD, Linux vServer, and Windows containers. Uh, this is a paradigm shift, essentially, of virtualization. Instead of creating a whole virtual machine, we only create the parts necessary to make the specific application function as we want it to function. Now, knowing what a container is, how it works, and so on is one thing. How do we then connect this to the network? We still need a certain level of virtual networking. But this works a little bit differently than uh, virtual machines. So here we have an example of three containers. Now, uh, in a typical installation, you'll have thousands of containers, but we have three containers in this case, just for, for uh, demonstration purposes. Now, various uh, um, container engines will do this in different ways, specifically Docker. Uh, what it does is it assigns a private IP address on each container. So you might have 192, dot 168.5.17 dot dot to, to uh, container number one. You might have dot 18 on container number two and dot 19 on container number three. Then the, what these are then connected to what is known as a virtual bridge. Uh, it's essentially a switch, but the term that is used is bridge. Now this bridge is not as configurable as it is in a virtual uh, environment, 
But what it, what it essentially does is it either using IP tables, which is a Linux based um, application or NAT, it'll actually translate from the private addresses to the public addresses that you might want to use for that specific container. So um, if, if we are connected directly to the internet and uh, we want these applications available for people from the internet, then we could say, uh, we could then translate to uh, 17.24.3.1 and have uh, all of these translate with NAT to this external IP address which is assigned here. Now if this is in an internal uh, uh, network environment, for example a, an enterprise network, you might have uh, your private network infrastructure here with a subnet of 172.16.5.0/24 and you would be able to have either IP tables or not translate these addresses to your specific address space that you're using 172.16.5.5-15 let's say that this is the range that is given to the various uh, containers that are available there so uh, a, um, a client here that wants to use free radius, which is this one here, will uh, re reference IP address 172.16.5.7, which corresponds to dot nineteen, which is this container here. So the NAT will do the translation between those two. Now, now this is done because of the fact that you can have many, many containers uh, and uh, Docker will actually uh, manage this whole section for you if you choose to, or it you can actually go in and manually configure. It's not typically you wouldn't do that because of the administrative overhead that you would have for that, but it's uh, it, it is possible if you choose to do that. Now, what does all this have to do with the cloud? Now. Uh, this infrastructure of virtual devices and virtual servers, containers, and so on, uh, because it is virtual, it can exist anywhere. Um, it can exist anywhere, and you can connect to it via the network. So you may have uh, within your own data center a rack with several servers that are running containers or virtual uh, um, uh, virtual machines and have this connected to your corporate LAN so that users on this LAN will be able to connect to this uh, infrastructure, will be able to even go in, create a new container, create a new uh, virtual machine and so on. So you're providing uh, these services to your uh, end, end user. You might even have over the internet uh, a branch office. You might connect over VPN or over a WAN to that branch office and have another user here connect protected over that WAN and connect to the services that you are providing here. These are still cloud services even though they're on the enterprise. So for the end user creating such uh, infrastructure, creating such resources such as containers and virtual machines is as simple as connecting to the platform and creating the server you want to create. Now this platform may not be on your um, corporate network. This platform actually may be on the internet uh, as a service. Now this could be Microsoft Azure or uh, Amazon AWS or Google Cloud Platform. It doesn't really matter. Over the internet uh, you might have your enterprise connected to the internet here and have uh, some client connect here and if you have the service you can then uh, log in, create your containers, um, and uh, have create your containers, create your services, uh, and then have users either in the enterprise connect directly to those services or users on the internet to co direct, connect directly to those um, services. So when we talk about the cloud, all we're saying is that these virtual devices are somewhere on the on the network with in a virtual environment within a, a server somewhere either on our own data center or on on some data center which is hosted by another 
by a cloud provider somewhere on the internet. But what you essentially what you need in order to be able to do this is network connectivity to that service. So if this service is here and you don't have network connectivity to get there, then it's no, no there's no use in either creating or using such services. So the whole concept is that you have resources somewhere on the network and you are actually reaching them via the network. So this gives a, a general overview of um, uh, virtual networking, why it's important. Hopefully this gives you a, a better idea of what uh, virtualization is, uh, what the term cloud environment means, and how virtual networking fits into all of this uh, uh, infrastructure. I hope that this has been informative for you, and I would like to thank you very much for viewing.